today we're going to talk about that second part of that of the scripture, which is grow in knowledge. All right, I'm going to give you my kind of my personal testimony before we start. Um, my my kind of journey of growth um, since well since the childhood. So as a child, I was I was very shy, right, mom? I was a very shy kid. You can she can attest to it over there. Um, I remember one time. Well, first of all, I hated speaking in public. Believe it or not, I, I hated public speaking. Uh, I was an introvert. Um, I, you know, I was kind of to myself. I had my group of friends at school, and uh, I had a lot of friends, even though Christina would say otherwise. That, you know, we always joke around that I had more friends than her, but she's like, no, no way. Um, but I had a very diverse group of friends, friends everywhere. You know, I didn't have just one clique. I had many, many friends. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I had many friends everywhere, but I was still kind of to myself. I did my own thing. You know, I, I like to play Legos in my own room. Um, I like to play Connects. Do you guys remember Connects and Erector Sets? I, I did all of that by myself. I built this huge crane, a Connects crane one time, all by myself, and I loved it. Um, but one day, we had a project in, it was in high school, uh, junior, freshman year in high school, we had to build a, uh, a diagram, a diorama, or just a, <laughs> you remember that. We had to build something um, from history. So I chose to build the Parthenon. You guys familiar with the Parthenon? Uh, Greek, Greek Parthenon. I, I chose to build that, that temple, um, and I, I think I did awesome. All right? I, 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 my mom took me to Michael's Craft. We bought some balsa wood some uh, craft sticks, um, the popsicle sticks, and I built this incredible Parthenon, like to scale. It was so cool. It was huge. And I built it to scale. It was awesome. I wanted to be an architect or an engineer uh, kind of growing up. So this, this was like my first experience in doing that. And when I presented that project to the class, everybody in the class built something, but their thing was like this big. It's like that. It was tiny. It was tiny. So me being the introvert, I, I was, I was, uh, was kind of scared to present it because I overdid it. I felt like I overdid the project. Even though that was the project, we had to do something like that. I felt like I did too much. So I presented the project, and then when I got home, I threw that thing away. Right? To this day, I regret throwing that project away um, because it was so cool. Uh, but I threw it away just because of what I felt. I felt like I just overdid it. I was embarrassed. Everybody was looking at me like, oh, this overachiever, you know, and I just didn't like it. So I threw it away. Um, that just goes, you know, I, I, it, it didn't help that I hated public speaking. So I hated speaking in front of groups. So that didn't help as well. Um, but that was my first kind of experience of, of being let down um, with, with people in general. Uh, I played... I played baseball all my life. I, Monday through Friday, no, Monday through Saturday, we were on the field four days a week. We did a lot of baseball. So I grew in baseball. I did really, really, I had a lot of growth in baseball. Uh, and then I, I still felt like you know, it's not, it wasn't enough. That's not where the, the Lord wants me. So kind of through, uh, through high school, I left baseball. I didn't play baseball in high school. Um, and then the Lord just started showing me what I wanted to what I needed to be in life. I wanted to be a cop all my life. I wanted to follow after my dad's footsteps. And that didn't happen. So when I got married with Christina, we, we, uh, I, I decided to go to uh, ACC for um, EMT to be a firefighter. So I did EMT basic, the EMT basic course to get the qualifications to become a fire firefighter. And I completed it. I got my certificate in it. So I'm a certified EMT. If anybody needs anything. Uh, that was a long time ago. That was 20 years ago, so I don't think that things are the same anymore. Um, but I did that, and then as soon as I completed that course, I had it set to become a firefighter. I had a sponsor from another firefighter buddy of mine. He gave me all of his gear uh, so I can go ahead and go into the fire academy and do it. But as soon as I completed that course, the Lord just said, no, this isn't where you're supposed to be. And for me, it was the way he told me is that we were having a baby. Or did we have Elijah already? We were just about to have him or something. We were planning on having him. <laughs> but I was thinking about our future, my future as a father. And, um, 
And he was like, no, you can't be away from your family, you know, for that long. For It's one day on, two days off, which isn't a big deal, but it wasn't working out for me. It's not where the Lord wanted me. So I continued going to, um, at that same time, I was in business school at USF. Am I, am I twisting the story or I just left USF? Oh, man. So I, I was in USF. I was doing uh, business. I wanted to be an engineer. That didn't work out. The Lord did not want me to be an engineer. And I decided to go to the business school, and I did 17 credits at USF. And, and then I was, this isn't where the Lord wants me. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I left uh, USF, and I started my own business, landscaping business, and it's been great. Okay? The Lord has really provided, and that's where he wanted me. Not because of landscaping, but because of the time that I get to devote to him. Okay, so it was it was a walk from from the from the birth <laughs> to where I'm at right now. Um, it was just one step after another, growing and learning. Lord, where do you want me? Lord, what am I supposed to be doing? And and you guys see me up here now preaching, guys. This is this this you, who was here for my first preaching? I know you were. I was all nervous. I was a big ball of nerves, and. Um, it was hard. It was hard. And it's still kind of hard because I love preaching to the youth. I love you guys, but I really love preaching to the youth. That's, I love teaching the youth. So being up here is just me just overcoming all of these things that I've walked through in my life. And just I'm looking at myself to this point right now, and I'm like, Lord, you've really grown me. Lord, you've taken me from a kid that did not want to speak to anybody in public to somebody that is able to stand up here and give a message about God. Um, so I'm not trying to boast. I'm not, that's, you guys know my heart. That's not me. But I, wanna, I wanted to show you that I'm a human. You know, I, I have been where a lot of you have been. I have made the, the difficult decisions of changing the course of my life because that's not what the Lord wanted me, wanted me to do. I have been there. Um, and every step that you take, every time you hear from the Lord, every time you follow the Lord, it's one step in growth. You are growing. You're doing more. You're serving the Lord. You're, you're growing. You're actively growing. So just keep on going. Amen? All right. That's a good message. I think I can end it there. <laughs> Let's not do that. Um, today, we're going to talk about growing in knowledge. So 2 Peter 3.18 again says, but growing the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To be a Christian is not a mindless experience, okay? It involves knowledge and understanding. It means establishing a personal relationship and intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs 9.10 says, Wisdom begins with respect for the Lord, and understanding begins with knowing the Holy One. Guys, we cannot understand the Father's love until we know Him. You cannot understand the Father's, Father's love until we have a knowledge of him. We're going to talk about three different types of knowledge that I was able to come with. There's probably more, but these are the three that the Lord led me to. Um, so just being saved, just having that, that grace, following the, the, having, receiving the grace of the Lord and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, Growth doesn't end there. I think I touched a little bit about on it last week, and I said uh, we're meant to be more than just accept Jesus Christ. We're meant to do a lot more than just to occupy a seat in this church. We're meant to do a lot more than say, I am saved. That's not what the Lord wants for us. Yes, we're going to heaven. Okay, You're saved. You received your salvation. You're going to heaven. But it doesn't end there. At least it shouldn't end there for us Christians. We need to keep on going. We need to keep on growing. So we talked about the grace last week, and today we're going to talk about knowledge again. Um, the first type is intellectual knowledge. Matthew 22, actually before I go there, uh, this knowledge, this intellectual knowledge, is the foundation of our faith. So how do you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? All of a sudden something comes out of the blue and says, you know, come and accept me. I, maybe, maybe. I, I, it probably doesn't happen a whole lot, but typically you hear a message, you get... 
you hear something, it goes into your intellect, and then you receive it, and you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. So it begins with this intellect, this intellectual knowledge of Christ. You have to hear somebody talk about Christ. Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord. Uh, you must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your what? All your mind. Three things, mind being the last one. You must love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So we know that uh, growing or knowledge involves intellect. It says it right there. You have to love him with your mind. Psalm 119, 11, and 12 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Teach me your decrees. That is involving your mind. Listen to what the Lord is saying in the word that you read. Let him teach you what he has for you. If we don't know God's word, we will not be able to defend ourselves when the enemy comes knocking. That's intellect. That is intellectual knowledge. You have to know the word of God in order to defend yourself from the attacks of the enemy. You have to know the word of God in order to bring somebody um, to in the kingdom of heaven, right? You have to know the word of God. See, it doesn't just end when you say, I accept you, Jesus Christ. Come into my heart. It doesn't just end there. Now you got to read the word of God. Now you got to get into the word of God. Now you have to spend time with the Lord. Um, you have to listen to other teachers. You have to listen to Bible studies. You've got to be active and participate in the kingdom. That's intellectual knowledge. That's where it all begins. Number two is experiential knowledge. So experiences. Here you go from knowing God to experiencing God. And say that again. Here you go from knowing God to experiencing God. Philippians 3, 10 through 11 says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. How many of you want to know Christ and experience his mighty power? I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that no one way, so that no one way or another, I will experience the resurrection one way. Uh, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. That's pretty powerful. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Let me put it in the, um, I love the way the Amplified Version says it. it. It just really breaks it down. And it says this, and this, so that I may know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in the same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers. And that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did, so that I may attain to the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. I love that. I love that. I want to give you some, some, uh, some different um, examples of this type of knowledge in the Bible. The first one being uh, Genesis 22 through 30. Jacob wrestled with God all night, and it left a physical mark on his life. He experienced God. Jacob experienced the Lord. He had knowledge of the Lord already. Now he experienced the Lord. You have Moses and Joshua in Exodus 33, 11. Moses met face to face with God in the tent of meeting. But after Moses left, Joshua uh, would stay in God's presence. So Moses had an experience with God. It doesn't just end with knowledge. Moses had an experience with God. Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 6, says, Isaiah saw the Lord, and it shook him deep in his soul. Again, Isaiah saw the Lord. He had an experience with God. And then Saul, in Acts 9, Saul, Paul, saw, saw Jesus Christ, 
And in a moment, he went from persecuting the church to becoming a convert, to becoming one of the most influential people in the Bible. Saul, Paul, had an experience with God. It wasn't just all, everything he learned by reading the word. He had an experience with the Lord. Um, I had an experience with the Lord, and uh, I call it my, my turning point, was um, when I received my prayer language. That was my turning point. That was the first time I really experienced the Lord. It's actually a really funny story. Um, but I received my prayer language, and I'm not afraid to say it. I received my prayer language at a women's conference. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> I received my prayer language at a women's conference. Um, I remember I was given the task of being the photographer because I am such a great photographer. I'm really not. Uh, but I was given the task of being the photographer, and uh, he, I forget who it was. I don't remember the guy's name. I forget who it was. But they, they asked if anybody wanted to receive a prayer language I was all, all the way in the back of the room. And I walk up to <laughs> all these women. There was a lot of women in the room. And I was way in the back. I, I put, my, put my camera down, and I walk up to the front. And I was the first one there. I beat all the women to the front. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and then he went around, and, and he just he prayed over us. And he prayed over me individually, and then I received my prayer language. Um, but that was my first experience in, um, in knowing the Lord. And it hasn't stopped since. It's just been, it, it keeps on growing. Yeah, you know, we have some rough times, but that's okay. The Lord is still good, right? So that was my first experience. And I, I want you guys to just, you know, Think about it. When was your first experience? When was the first time you experienced the Lord? If you know it, raise your hand. Not bad. You, you can recall that day. Yeah, I don't think it's something we ever really forget, especially me being a women's conference. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it, it's just a memorable time in our lives, the first time you experience the Lord. And then for those of you that raise your hand, has it stopped? Have you had rough times? Yeah. But you know God is good. Amen. So it just continues, continues to go. Um, that, that was an awesome time. I was 18 years old. I was 18 years old. It was, was really when I began to experience the Lord. Um, as a kid, I didn't say this in the beginning, but I, I didn't have, I knew of God. Okay, I knew who Jesus was. I knew that we should believe in him. Um, but I didn't have a relationship with God. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And uh, that's how I was most of my life until I was, I don't know, 15 when we really started to go to church. And my aunt used to take us to the backyard. We used to go every Sunday to my grandmother's house, the entire family. And my aunt would do Bible studies with, with the kids every Sunday. And I credit her with just introducing me to having that experience with the Lord. Um, because she, she didn't give up, you know, she kept on going. <laughs> we were kids, okay, we messed around. We didn't listen to half the things she was saying, but she continued to just plant that seed. Um, and then that's when I, you know, when I found out about God and who he is, but it was all intellect at that time. And then again, the experience came when I received my prayer language. Um, So I had this little um, analogy here. So spectators watch a game, but they don't grow stronger by watching, right? So if you go to a Bucks game, who's going to the Bucks game today? Is it? I don't even know if it's here. Probably not here. Uh, but who's going to watch the Bucks game tonight? Oh my goodness! <laughs> that is so sad. Is that one? Oh, but nobody raised their hand. Okay. Me and Kyle, there you go. Um, but when you're watching this game, are you growing stronger by watching this game? No, you're not growing stronger. But are the players who are actually playing this game, are they growing stronger? Yes. Are they growing wiser and they're learning their opponent or their enemy? Yes. 
All right, so what I'm trying to say here is, are you in the crowd watching the game or are you on the field playing it? Where are you in your spiritual walk? Are you watching and letting everybody else do the work or are you actually on the field playing the game? That's what the Lord wants for all of us. He doesn't want us just, again, to sit down and occupy a seat. He doesn't want us to just go on about our day after we leave here on Sunday. We're fed for an hour, an hour and a half, and then we're back to normal. We're back to the grind, as we call it. He doesn't want us just to come here once or twice a week. No, we have to be playing in this game that the Lord has given us. We have to be active. It's the only way you're going to grow. You have to be active. So you have to be reading the word of God. You have to be partaking in uh, fellowship. You have to be partaking in Bible studies or doing Bible studies, devotions. You have to be active in order to grow. Where are you? Where are you, church? See, in America, we are so privileged. We have, I was just talking, Christina mentioned this morning, we have everything spoon-fed to us. We don't have to work for anything in America. And that's why it's so easy for us to just be complacent and sit down and occupy a seat because we're going to get it spoon-fed to us. That's not what the Lord wants. That's not what the Lord wants. I've been on this, on this, this word the Lord has given me for probably over 10 years. These words is just break complacency. Like that's been in my mind for over 10 years now. As Americans, we are so complacent. We're okay with the way everything is going. We know we're going to be okay. We know we're going to get out of it. We know the government is going to take care of us. <laughs> we know it's going to be okay because we're American. We're in America, land of the free, right? But we need to break that complacency because that's not what the Lord wants. You guys hear me? Am I being too harsh? Well, Pastor Sarah gave me permission to be harsh, so no. <laughs> we, have to, we have to be active, guys. It's not enough just to say, yes, Lord. It's not enough just to say, I love you, Lord, and I receive you. No, we, we have to be active. Find out what you can do. Find out how you can experience the Lord. Amen? Amen. The third one is spiritual knowledge. So this one is, is, I call wisdom. Here you go from experiencing him to trusting him and living for him. So this one's a little harder. But this is, this is the part where you say, have it your way. God, I give it all up to you. Lord, take care of my life. I trust you, Jesus. This is a little harder because we don't like to let go of the things that we have. You know, we like to be in control of our lives. We like to be in control of, of what we can be in control of. We, we love that opportunity. But this is the part where you say, Lord, you are in control. This is the spiritual knowledge. Proverbs 3, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what's the rest of it? Lean not on your own understanding. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Do not depend on your own understanding. You may understand God one way in you know, some way, but it could be completely off from what the Lord actually wants you to know. You may think you have your life in control. You may think that everything is well because... You are just all glorious and awesome, and you are in complete control. But the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding. Amen? Then the way you live, and, all, and then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. Why? Because if you're leaning on your own understanding, who are you pleasing? Yourselves. No, we're not meant to please ourselves. Yes, we're, we're meant to have a good time. We're meant to do... Uh, great things, but it's really to please the God, to give God all the glory. Then you will live, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of what? Good fruit. 
Firehouse, where are you? Good fruit. We've been talking about fruit, what, the last eight weeks, right? That's some good fruit, right? Amen. Yeah, we just did it. We're, we're about to complete our study on the fruit of the Spirit. Um, so you're going to produce all of this kind of good fruit if you allow the Lord to guide you, to lead you, to take control of your lives. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Listen to that part. All the while, you will what? Grow. You will grow as you learn to know God better and better. You guys trust the Lord with your lives. Yeah, can you honestly say that? Like if the Lord came here right now and said, give everything up for me, would you do it? I hope so. (laughs) It, It could be a very simple question for some of us, but for others it could be a pretty hard question to answer. You know, um, we've got to let go of that control in our lives and just say, Lord, have your way, God. I trust you, Jesus. Lord, you knew me from, from the moment I was born. You knew me before I was born, God. You knew me before I was in my mother's womb, Lord. What makes you think that I know more than you? Or what makes me think that I know more than you? If you knew exactly where I was going to be in this moment since the beginning of time. Not much. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen a year from now. So how can we possibly say that we know more than him? How can we possibly say that I want to control my life? We can't. We're giving it to somebody far superior who knows so much more than us when we release that power. I'm going to give you some um, spiritual knowledge examples in the Bible. Now, some of you... Um, I want you to listen to these. I mean, these are all uh, Bible characters, but I want you to listen, because some of them, you, you could be going through some of these things or something like it um, right now. But the first one is uh, trusting God to provide, Luke 5, 5 through 7. Master Simon replied, he worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. And this time, their nets will be so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought the partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and the verge of sinking. Trusting God to provide. How many of you need to trust God right now to provide for you? There's a living, breathing example right there in the Word of God. He provided for the, it was actually just more to show them look at the power that I have. Look what I can do, guys. But But Simon trusted him and put his nets out, and he allowed God to do the work. So do you have to put your nets out there? Is it time to let go of those nets, release the nets, and allow God to provide for you? Number two, trusting God for your unfulfilled desires. This is about Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, John the Baptist's parents. Both were well advanced in age. Some of them, uh, scholars believe they were probably around 50 or, or older. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, you would have a baby that would be called John, and he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. How many of you have unfulfilled desires today in this room? Trust God that he will fulfill those desires. Number three, trusting God with impossible situations. Moses. He was being chased by an Egyptian army. And what had to happen? He had to part the sea. He had to get across the sea. And he opened up the sea. The Lord opened up the sea for him. And he parted the Red Sea. Um, That is an impossible situation. How many of you have an impossible situation that you have to overcome right now? Yeah, trust God. He will provide a way out. He will provide a way. Trust him. Uh, trusting, Jesus, trusting that Jesus heals. That woman with the issue of blood. Jesus was walking through a crowd, and someone touched his, his, uh, his, his garment. And she was healed immediately. 
How many of you trust Jesus to heal you? You got to trust him. You got to trust God. And there's so many other examples. There's so many other things that, uh, that we can say, you know, we may be going through. But I, I, I'm here to tell you today, you guys have to trust God. Okay? You have to trust the Lord. You've got to give it up. Give all of your own um, ways to do things. You've got to give it all up and say, Lord, this is, I, I want you, God. How, well, how desperate are you? How desperate are you for your healing? How desperate are you uh, to receive your unfulfilled desires? How desperate are you to trust God that he'll provide for you? How, that's what it kind of comes down to. How dr- desperate are you? How much do you really want it? Yeah, if you really want it, you've got to trust him. I had a, the turning point in my life when I uh, finally began to experience God in, in a spiritual way was when my, uh, my son Noah, my third, third child, was born. Some of you, most of you know that story. Pastor Eric touched on it the other day. Uh, but just to kind of give you a brief summation of it, he was born with epidermolysis bullosa, which is a uh, skin condition where there's lesions throughout his body. Uh, basically, we couldn't touch him. We, he was wrapped in gauze and like Vaseline and all this stuff. We couldn't touch him for, well, for as long as he had that disease. We, um, he was transferred to All Children's Hospital in St. Pete. And there the Lord healed him. Now, these were open lesions. You saw the picture a couple weeks ago. These were open lesions, open wounds that were healed. The moment we began to trust in Jesus. That was my turning point. That was the first time I experienced God in a spiritual way. That was my turning point. See, sometimes it takes an experience experiential knowledge, to move, to move up to the next level, a spiritual knowledge. Now, because of that, I know that I can trust God with the rest of my life. Because if he was able to heal my son, what is he not able to do? If he was able to keep my son on this earth, which doctors say the average lifespan is only 10 years of a horrible, miserable life where nobody can touch you, where you constantly have to be wrapped in gauze, all the days of your life. Just to know that you're probably going to die by the age of 10. But if the Lord can heal my son, what can he not do? That was my turning point. I can sum up all of this with uh, something that C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis wrote. And uh, we're going to call this the at versus along knowledge of Christ. At versus along, and you'll see why in a second. But C.S. Lewis found this distinction indispensable and illustrated it in his essay titled uh, Meditation in a Tool Shed. He said, I was standing today in the dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside, and through the crack at the top of the door there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing the things by it. Then I moved so that the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed, and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door green leaves, moving on the branches of a tree outside. And beyond that, 90-odd million miles away, the sun, looking along the beam and looking at the beam, are very different experiences. What we see depends on, what we see depends upon where we are standing. Any person can learn something about Christianity from the outside. You can read the Bible. You can study, with, with, uh, study what Christians believe and examine the life of Christ. These are all good things, guys. Studying, reading, these are all really, really good things. But it's important to remember, however, that a Christian is someone who has been born again and knows God personally as Savior and Lord from the inside. So I ask you, are you where are you? Are you looking at the beam or are you looking along it? Are you seeing what everybody else is doing? Are you just a spectator? 
or are you looking at the beam, through the beam, so you can see Jesus Christ? Where are you? To look at something is to try and grasp it intellectually using reason, to view it analytically from an objective, detached perspective. To look along something, on the other hand, is to engage with it experientially using one's physical senses or imagination, to view it from a deeper, more personal perspective. In other words, to look at it is to inspect. To look along, listen to this, to look at it is to inspect. To look along is to immerse. So, again, are you looking at it or are you looking along Jesus Christ? Are you inspecting or are you immersed in Jesus? Amen. I got quiet. I got really quiet. I know some of you are thinking, but um, God loves you. God loves you. I'm going to conclude with this verse. And I want you to listen to this verse. It's Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. Amen. Amen. So I ask you today, are you guys spectators or are you guys active? Are you guys active in the kingdom of God? Are you just watching to see what goes on? Are you just watching to see how all of this plays out? Or are you a participant in the kingdom of God? There's plenty of opportunities for everybody to participate. You know, whether that be... um, partaking in Bible studies, whether that be serving in ministry or whatever it is, there's plenty of opportunities for all of us to participate. We just have to have the desire to do it. You have to have the desire to continue to grow um, in knowledge and in grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want it? Do you want it? Amen. Let's pray, um, and then we will uh, we'll dismiss. Oh, we got done early. All right, let's stand up.